Yeah, we actually weren't sure if we should talk about ETH2 because we're like, well, wait, this is a WebAssembly conference. Um, or shouldn't we give it to WebAssembly? But then we were like, oh, well, there's also blockchain in the title. So can't forget about the blockchain. Um, <clears throat> so phase one and done is this uh, idea of a minimal execution engine, and that's what Scout prototypes. But to explain the origin of it, I want to walk through some history, run through it rather. Uh, so the history actually starts with um, back in 20, yeah, end of 2015, early 2016, when Casper was uh, an algorithm known as consensus by bet. And it would late, uh, Casper would later pivot to consensus by justification, but even at this early time, there were, there was an early realization, this was an early realization of an idea that would become more and more important, which is the, these two betting cycles, um, this block hash betting cycle and the state root betting cycle, that these are two fundamentally different, different processes. Um, so the first is a consensus game, and that's the hard one. That solves the data availability problem. Um, no particular order is correct. And the second process, the you know betting on the, the state routes, is uh, its outcome is deterministic, so that makes it much um, you know a much easier problem. So fast forward to 2018. Did you have a question? I think I must be misunderstanding your second bullet. Yes. Uh, the, the fundamental problem that causes the need for a consensus mechanism is arrival order non-determinism. When two messages arrive at approximately the same time, there's no objective basis for determining which one comes first, and right. therefore you have to engage in a consensus mechanism to, so, so, so there's a fundamental non-determinism, and then people enter the consensus mechanism with different opinions about which message came first, and then you, re, re, you resolve to all agree on one right. of those opinions. So can you explain your, the second bullet in those terms? Because it seems to just sort of, because um, I think I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, what's so. What's deterministic? The consensus game that determines um, that resolves this dispute over, you know, what the uh, arrival order was of messages. But you don't actually have to inspect, you know, the contents of those messages. So once everybody agrees on the order, then you can execute them later. So that's what the second bullet point is about. Okay, this is once they agree on the order. Right. Yeah. Isn't the whole problem of how you come to an agreement on the order? That's, yeah, that's the first problem. I got it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, so fast forward, the each two phases, this, you know, phase, um, phase one, yeah, it was, it was built on that, you know, that uh, realization that those two processes are fundamentally different. Um, so phase one is where the consensus game happens. Phase two is the verification game, and ideally these two phases would, would be decoupled. This was our understanding, or at least my understanding, um, as of uh, July 2018. So yeah, about uh, right around the same time last year uh, in Berlin at the uh, Ethereum Client Developers Conference was Phase one and phase two were going to be decoupled, and that was the goal. So, fast forward to DevCon 2014. Um, there was still not really any clear path forward on how to on how to uh, how phase two would work, and this hit me particularly hard because I was nominated as the working group facilitator um, for the phase two working group at the, uh, at the ETH2 workshop. And when I stood up at the end of the workshop and gave the summary to the other working groups, and I said, well, we don't really know how it's gonna work, but uh, 
Vitalik came over the last 10 minutes and said he thinks delayed execution w will be easier. Um, well, people were underwhelmed, as you can imagine. Um, <laughs> I mean, and it was it was super awkward too because phase one is just data blobs, and the initial proposal was that all these data blobs would be filled with zero bytes. So if we're going to launch phase one, and then I mean, it was kind of silly to lot to launch 1,000 shards filled with zero bytes, and then figure out phase two. But that was the plan. Um, so fast forward to like, you know, getting into spring of um, this year, 2019, and all questions are still open, all possibilities are on the table, nothing's really been decided. Um, are there any other questions we're missing? Any other uh, features we want to add to this kitchen sink of um, everything under the sun? <laughs> in two weeks. Uh, yeah, so I remember in, uh, I made a joke of this at uh, and my DEF CON talk too, because some news had come out that Ethereum 2.0 research was finally stabilizing. I said, well, that's great. Maybe we can answer some really basic questions like, uh, well, are we going to use the state rent or state list? Is it going to be immediate execution, delayed execution? Well, you know, how will cross shard calls work? None of these questions were answered, but research was stabilizing. No, but really, do you have a plan when you're going to release or are you just still researching? Uh, we're going to release as soon as possible. Um, so this created a tension between the EWASM team and the research team because we work on the execution engine, they're working on the sharding protocol, so they're asking us, hey, since cross-shard transactions use, are gonna be doing execution, how are they gonna work? And we said, well, depends on you know, what guarantees the protocol provides. It would be nice if you provide like, a guarantee on the order of message delivery. Uh, are th is there any such guarantee? And the best we could determine is that no, there is no such guarantee. And um, another, so another thing that made phase one and done, um, I think, possible to imagine was that there was a shift uh, in the 1.x, yeah, in the 1.x uh, movement, where <clears throat> uh, definitely last year uh, in, in June, Developers, the stateless was sort of like it was. It was dismissed. I mean, even even in Sydney at the Sydney workshop, I, I said, "Well, all this is a lot easier if you could do stateless shards." And like the crowd, you know, just uproared in laughter as if it was a joke. Uh, <laughs> but it was not a joke. Um, these are some reasons why people. Um, really wanted to get state rent. I think another reason developers are attracted to state rent is it's like, I get to be a landlord, I'm gonna charge everybody fees. You know, I, I don't know why, but. Uh, I've always preferred stateless. Um, if you're gonna sit down and implement it, I mean, unless you're an engineer who prefers lots of complexity and like thousands of lines of code uh, over, you know, simple stuff that's not that many lines of code. You should prefer stateless. Also, uh, <laughs> this question about how cross shard calls work really started to, you know, grind my gears. And um, and when we realized that that there was not going to be any guarantee on the order, uh, you know, the delivery of um, that, you know, cross shard messages would be delivered. Uh, unless we, you know, invented it, then it was like, uh, well, if you don't have that, then, you know, everything gets a lot easier. So, and it was, I think Alex, yeah, message said, well, yeah, you know, we do do something simple. It's going to be, you know, the DevX will be terrible, but it will definitely work. And that was sort of the inspiration for phase one and done. 
Um, so it was initially a post. Well, this was the post on ETH research, and uh, waited for a while to hear, you know, what some of the E2 researchers and architects would say. And uh, 16 days later, um, Metallic posted a reply and said he'd been thinking in a sim similar direction. And um, so then in the following weeks, he drafted up two sort of half done specs on, uh, you know, on HackMDs. And um, finally, and when the phase two proposal two uh, spec was drafted, then Alex decided to prototype it. So this is the inspiration. It was um, just forget about phase two. There's still uh, <laughs> it's still a point of contention because I like to call it execution in phase one, but um, Vitalik likes to call it uh, minimum like consensus layer phase two. And anyway, they. Phase two is supposed to be where the de the developer experience will get easier. Um, so, but this is a pivot from the the previous roadmap where everything was where where execution and data blobs were decoupled. So, I mean, the proposal is to process the data blobs. So, maybe this would be easier if we show some diagrams. I want to invite Alex up with me now too, if you don't mind. Because we've worked on these diagrams together. Um, Can you hear me? No. Can you hear me? <laughs> this? No, I think it. It's green. Yeah, I think. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah, yeah so this, um, basically, this is the beacon chain. This is a huge monster. Uh, But we don't really know what the beacon chain is, and uh, we don't need to know in order to do any of these. So we just ignored and black boxed all these parts. Right, thank you. Yeah. Um, and phase one is where the shards come in. So these dashed arrows are the uh, cross links, and the idea is that each beacon block, um, the shard gets, the, um, a particular shard gets cross linked in. So you know, at beacon block n, it's shard 64's turn to get cross-linked. Beacon block n plus one, it's the, you know, next shard and then the next shard and so forth. So, um, and when you visualize it, it it's like a, a spiral around the, the beacon block, or the beacon chain, rather. Uh, so, this was the, uh, well, this is the existing, uh, the previous, hopefully soon to be deprecated, phase one spec, uh, which there's no execution in, in the shards, but there is hashing happening. And so uh, every shard validator is hashing, you know, using SHA-256. Um, it returns the, the hash, and that's it. So no execution unless you consider running a hash function to be running the same hash function over and over to be execution. Is there transactions in the blockers? No, these are, these are all zero bytes, because this is phase one. They don't have to be zero bytes, but... Um, so the, the, the validators can just make blocks and put whatever they want in the blocks? Yes, yes, oh, that's correct. Okay. Seems pointless. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it was a little silly, but the problem was you, uh, the fee market to determine what validators would put in, you know, to incentivize validators to include user transactions, that was you know, kicked out to phase two. So until you figure out phase two, it was, you know, validators just put in either zero bytes or, or junk or maybe something useful. But all, you, all, all, the, all, all the validators know um, what they have to do is that they just shot, you know, hash it. Uh, so this is where we add execution. And instead of running the same hash function over and over, we uh, run some WASM code. And doesn't really, like, don't worry about where the WASM code comes from. Just recognize that 
when you uh, use the block data as input and you, instead of running the same hash function, you, you run, uh, you know, some, some WASM code and then you return the new state root. So instead of returning the hash of the blob, you return the, uh, the, the value returned from the WASM code. And so now the cross links, whereas before you were, uh, when a cross, when, when a shard was getting cross linked into the, the beacon chain, um, what that was doing is it was like, you know, it was cross linking in the, the hash of all the, the, the shard blocks. Um, now we're updating the, the state routes. So you'd have like a, a hash of all the state routes that are on the shard and um, those get updated in the beacon chain when, uh, when it gets cross-linked. Before you move on, yeah. is, is this somewhat clear? We need to clear up this, I think, before we move on, just briefly. So I, I kind of have a vague idea what does block data contain, but I'm not sure, like, how does uh, this code ID and exec and for is selected? Like, is it specific for this particular uh, shard or uh, like one shard can have, uh, can ex execute different uh, codes uh, or like? Um, I think it's still not really clear to people uh -huh. um, exactly where, like, one question was, well, if you have a execution environment deployed on the beacon chain, which let's call that code, um, is there a, di well. Are shards homogeneous or hydro hy 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 heterogeneous? Well, they're homogeneous in the sense that they all run the same WASM VM, but um, where exactly the the code comes from, so like, can you pass in code when you call it? But what, what, is, what is for sure is that the state routes are on the shards. Whether the code is on the shards or the code is on the beacon chain, um, I don't know, that, that's kind of a detail. Can I give my understanding of this? Yeah. Um, at least my understanding and what the prototype implements today, and of course all of this is sub subject to change, but I think what this Vitalik's proposal two is, that's what is implemented by the prototype we have, and basically that's the current shared understanding between all the people working on E2.0 execution. So that's what we try to explain here. I don't quite understand here. it, but. <laughs> um, is there else on the yes, there are, I would say, how many, six people now. Um, well, actually more. So a lot of people on the eWASM team are working on it. Vitalik is working on it. Um, and three people from the consensus R&D team are heavily involved. So it's, I think it's over 10 people now. Um, but what, what's important to understand here is the distinction between the two parts. We have the, we have the beacon chain uh, and we have the shards. And in both, both the, the beacon chain blocks uh, and the shard blocks are proposed by validators. And those validators are selected through a process. Um, and the beacon chain itself has transactions, but it's, it's of very, very limited nature. Those transactions are used to, to move deposits into, um, into Ethereum 2, uh, to move that between validators, etc. And in this case, a new transaction is introduced to deploy this WASM code. Um, and that WASM code- On the beacon chain, right? On the beacon chain. And that WASM code is stored on the beacon chain. Um, so the, the beacon state stuff there, uh, it doesn't list for some reason the, there's this, do we have the, like the uh, pointer? Sorry, uh, who, who can deploy uh, code on beacon chain? Not clear, don't know yet. Well, validators can. Yeah, but, uh, well, there was like, a, anyway, there was yeah. like a pointer, but, so we have the beacon state up there, right? And we have this, this codes part in it. And, and that's, that's the, the, the object where we store all these WASM codes on the beacon state. Um, and then we have the shards, and the shards who proposes a new shard block is again uh, selected through a process. And the shard block here is going to refer to uh, three, three things of information. It's going to refer to what kind of code you are executing, so like an identifier on the beacon state, 
and it will refer to the shared account uh, you're working with. And the shared account only has a single bit of information, uh, which is this shared state, which is the, the hash. What the so um, for the state root. Sorry, Martin, we're, we only have like 10 minutes left and we want to show Scout, so let's um, nail down these other details uh, over lunch or something. Um, so the term for, I, I like to call them ETH2 contracts, but the preferred term now is uh, execution environment. Um, so they get deployed to, like maybe the code gets deployed to the beacon chain, uh, state root gets deployed to a shard. Yeah, so anybody can deploy them. They're, they will be expensive. I think well, Vitalik's quote was it should cost $1,000 to you know, to create a thread, which that was another term uh, before Too people settled terms. on execution environment. Um, so another buzzword is relayers, and how will relayers, uh, you know, what's the relayer and execution environment? Um, Alex, did you have a question about? Uh... <laughs> I guess the confusing part is, is Bob, what, what is Bob there? Yeah, so that's Bob, you know, uh, Bob, Bob's, Bob's execution environment. Yeah, that's just Bob because anybody can deploy uh, execution environments and Bob decided to deploy his to the same shard as the ETH1 execution environment, which that is where we envision, um, you know, switching over the current ETH1 state and chain into a shard on, on ETH2. Well, let's say uh, we switch it over into a, we drop it into shard 64, well then Bob can deploy his EE on shard 64 too and nothing's stopping him. Um, so now sometimes we have to wait for Bob's blocks, you know, to process the Ethereum ETH1 blocks. Um, yeah, and relayers, so I think Alex has some ideas about relayers and uh, I'll just turn it over to him. Yeah, um, are, are you guys sufficiently confused? Don't, don't ask questions. Uh, <laughs> j just to clarify, basically, we have these WASM codes, which we call execution environments. And they can be token contracts or whatever, or they can present their own little universes. Uh, and by universe, I mean they can, in this example, to make it clear, probably that's the easiest to, uh, to uh, imagine, is this eat one execution environment. Uh, the execution environment code is, of course, in WASM, but it is able to execute EVM, uh, EVM bytecode. And Bob is doing something else. Uh, but in order to interact uh, with a really good developer experience with these execution environments, you likely need another process called these relayers. And the, the dApps themselves are in, in contact with the relayers. They're submitting their stateful transactions to the re relayers, and the relayers are packaging these up into the actual blocks, the stateless blocks to be submitted to the shards, uh, and they are the ones also resolving any kind of conflicts, ordering, etc. Does is, is that a bit more clear? I hope it is. At least it's to Sergey. Um, something similar, yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, based on these, we, we have a kind of a roadmap. Um, and we split it into four different milestones. Um, and I'm going to go into those in, in some detail. Now, of course, the very important one is finishing this phase one execution, agreeing on the phase one execution, what it will look like. And this is the only bit needed in order to launch E2, uh, because developing these execution environments can be done separately. And I think these are the, the four key points uh, we need to agree on in order to, to launch phase one. Uh, we need to agree on what kind of interface we provide to the execution environments. Uh, so those are like the host functions to Wasm. Uh, we need to agree on how, how do we transfer the native token between the shards, within the shard, et cetera, and, and back to the beacon chain and from the beacon chain. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of things there. Um, we need to decide how do we do calls, whether within the shard and cross shards. Do we want to have any synchronous operation? Do we only want some kind of asynchronous here, operation? Here, I actually disagree. We don't need to... Um, agree on how to do cross shard calls. We do need to agree how to do in shard calls. But one other note on execution environment. Um, I said already. I already said before. It's in, it's a a contract on ETH2. Uh, 
but when you imagine like deploying a new ETH1 contract or speaking of an ETH1 contract inside the ETH1 execution environment, if you just call them contracts, you'd be saying the contract within the contract, which is... Didn't we had a rule, no questions? <laughs> No, but I agree that maybe the cross chat calls could be moved to the second block, which is helpful if you consider them. Because obviously you can implement them on top of this system, but if you start considering them, we may figure out some things which would be nice to consider in phase one. Um, but actually, if we want to be super strict, only the first two items are mandatory. Everything else can be an optimization. Um, and it's, it's helpful if you do consider how fee is going to work, how really is going to work, because we, we can take some of those ideas into phase one, and maybe it will be better. Uh, but strictly speaking, only the top two are necessary. Now, while we try to finalize phase one, of course, we have to start uh, experimenting with different execution environments. Uh, but this work doesn't have to be done uh, fully done before we finalize phase one. Um, some example execution environments we have listed here is a simple one is just validating EVM blocks, uh, which is practically running a EVM interpreter in Wasm. And we actually do have this uh, using a parity EVM. Um, we have some examples doing Starks and Snarks verification. There is a challenge to reach a, a specific speed uh, with Starks verification on Wasm. Uh, so that's why it's really important. Uh, and the, I think the, the biggest question we have, because all of this is stateless, uh, in order to do any kind of modification of the state, the data blob has to contain the witness to the state. Um, and therefore, what we started to do is experimenting with different encodings for witnesses. Uh, and the E2.0 team has this serialization format called SSC. It stands for simple serialization, I think. Um, and they, do all, they extended that to also contain Merkle trees uh, and to have witnesses and partial Merkle tree witnesses. Um, and we are trying to use that specification and trying to benchmark it whether, whether it's like, uh, is, it, is it resulting in a sufficiently small witness? Is it uh, easy to process it in Wasm? Uh, but there might be other formats. Sorry, Alex, but uh, yeah, I wanted to mention this, the idea of stateless, it became more possible with uh, uh, Alexei Akronov's initial experiments of uh, ETH1 stateless clients um, showing really good results. And I think at that point, uh, the idea of a stateless, you know, stateless clients, stateless contracts became um, a lot more practical. So the other big experiment, which I think came up yesterday as a couple of discussion points, is this pure Wasm execution environment. And the main challenge here is we want to execute Wasm within Wasm. Um, so that presents a couple of different challenges. Uh, and uh, I think we, we have a couple of good ideas how to do that. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail here because it's not well developed. But I think this would be something which it would be nice to interact with a lot of you in that process. Uh, OK. The, Yeah, but yeah, but we also need to to give it a host interface and somehow interact with the host interface. Uh, and the 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 next bigger milestone is this huge chunk of work, and I'm not going to finish this in one minute, but uh, I will try to do my best. Um, this huge chunk of work is creating a stateful environment uh, on E2, uh, and we start doing that by taking what Ethereum one is, uh, implementing that in Wasm feeding it the transactions uh, and the blocks. Um, but I think, and, and we also need to like, feed in all the witnesses, so it's going to be huge. Um, so I think our prototyping here, gonna, uh, our iteration is going to consist of changing certain parts of each one to be more suitable for this model. Uh, and maybe throughout this process, we're going to find a, a really good design. And we can propose at that point some of those changes to the mainnet. And once we arrived at this really good design, and we proposed those changes to mainnet, and the changes are applied to mainnet. We can do this final milestone, which is the ETH1 switchover. Uh, and the goal is that we move ETH1 entirely into ETH2. Um, but of course, this doesn't mean that we're going to move the entire data into ETH2. Rather, it's going to be uh, fully stateless. 
a hard fork or protocol update. Um, yeah, I think people prefer the protocol update uh, nowadays, but um, yeah, we also use the hard fork term. Now, uh, this is about the, the actual prototype we have. And apologies for, for the next speaker, uh, but I really want to show this. Um, oh, we have more time. OK, great. Um, so eWASM Scout is the actual prototype uh, we have written. Uh, it implements this proposal, too, uh, and it black boxes most of the phase zero and phase one stuff. Um, that this is the link here. It's, Jesus Christ. It's a monorepo. It has everything in that single link. So if, you want, if you're interested to interact with it, to develop stuff on it, you just need to click on that single link, and everything is to be found there. Uh, but we do have a longer eat research post which explains our motivations and the goals, uh, some of the considerations we have taken, and uh, some of the design. Um, and actually, in that thread, there is, it also starts off with all the links to these proposals. Um, so that's the only link you need to know in order to find all these phase two proposals. Uh, and there's some discussion on it between Vitalik, uh, uh, Matt, uh, and I. Uh, now, Scout itself. Uh, as I said, it's a monorepo, so it contains a couple of different things. Um, it defines this interface between the execution environments, uh, which we just call the EEI, execution environment interface. Um, it defines a testing format, uh, which is in YAML. Um, it provides a tool which can use this YAML and execute it and give you the results. Uh, it also provides a couple of example execution environments. So that's some of these things I've mentioned in, in Mystone 2. And it also benchmarks uh, these executions, because we really want to end up with a high-performant solution. Uh, so benchmarking is essential here. Uh, Rust, it's, uh, Scout itself is written in Rust. It's only 400 lines of code. It uses WASMI, uh, but it's designed to be flexible in using other interpreters or other engines, and even using multiple engines, um, and in order to benchmark all of these. Um, the execution, uh, do you have a question there? Change that to in phase one instead of on top of phase one. Where, where is that? <laughs> the last bullet. Oh, point. there. OK. Um, the, the actual execution environments, of course, are just wasm bytecodes, as we discussed. Um, and the goal here is that the design we end up with, hopefully, is the only execution bit uh, E2 clients have to implement. Uh, but I meant on top of phase one, so uh, E2 clients uh, right now, uh, implementing phase zero, which is the beacon chain. Uh, and they're going to implement phase one, which is the, sh the, the, shard, the shards uh, with the data blobs. Uh, and then they need to take this uh, 400 lines of code to execute those data blobs. That, that's all they need to do. Now, the, the interface we have uh, is basically what we try to explain with the, the graphs. Um, so the inputs. Uh, in each of, this is explaining here a uh, shard block. So what does a shard block contains? And out of the shard block, what does the execution environment receives? Um, so on the input side, uh, the execution environment receives this data blob. Uh, it, it can be large. It is just a data blob. And it also receives the, the state root of the, sh of the given shard currently, which is right now is just a 32-byte value. Uh, and then the execution environment does its thing, and it's going to return a new state root. It's another 32-byte va uh, 32 value. Um, and it can also re uh, return these deposit receipts for moving Ethereum uh, Ether around. And th this is basically what it looks like if translated into WASM host functions. Uh, E2 here is just the namespace. Um, load pre-state root is the, the host function name. Uh, and these are the parameters. Um, now we have in the repo today, we have a couple of examples. We have a hello world and the bazaar example. I'm going to go into detail in them. Uh, but we also have a couple of other working examples which haven't been merged yet. Um, the hello world and the bazaar example are written in Rust, but we also have a hello world in assembly script. Um, so the, the main reason we have this definition here is so that uh, people can implement execution environments in any language suitable uh, for WebAssembly. Mm, and in fact, 
uh, Paul has reminded me that he has written a hand, well, it was a C Hello World example, but it basically the output looked like as if he has hadn't written it in a WebAssembly text format. Um, there's also a snarks verification code in Rust, uh, BLS signature verification, a token contract in C, uh, and we have these two big pieces of work uh, which we independently started with uh, Matt from Consensus and me, and we hope to uh, resolve it into a single project, but that is the, the Ethereum 1 execution environment uh, uh, implementation. So that is right now in Rust, and I think it's going to be in Rust. Uh, because that's what most of the people uh, on the team are working in. Now, this is the example, the Hello World example. Um, so basically, we, we, root, uh, we load the, the root, um, and we check that there was no data sent. And since there was no data sent, of course, there's no change to the state. Uh, so we're just going to save the state. And that, that's a basic example. Um, does it make any sense? Yeah, I think so. The bizarre example is a bit more complex, and I'm not going to go into code here, but I want to explain the notation on the bottom. Um, so this is the notation the uh, E2 research team uses to describe their data structures. Uh, and they describe them in this SSZ serialization format. Mm, so each of these are uh, the message and the state input block. These are objects uh, which ca can have key value pairs. Uh, the, the bracket here means that it's a list. It's an array uh, of messages. Um, now, the actual serialization doesn't store the keys. Uh, it only stores the values. So in order to decode or encode uh, such data, you need to have the schema. Um, in the bazaar example is a, the simplest, dumb, uh, naive example to do a stateless contract. Uh, you need to submit the, the entire witness, and you need to submit the data you're changing. Now, the bazaar itself, uh, there's the big description on the top what it is. Uh, but basically, it has just a list of messages. And the message con uh, contains a timestamp and a message itself. Um, so the state here uh, is a state of bazaar. It's just a list of messages. Um, and to execute bazaar, uh, we are submitting two things, uh, which is this input block. So we need to submit the state, and we need to submit the new messages we are going to append. Uh, and the actual implementation, the state root of this is just a hash of the state. Um, and in the input, we have these new messages. Uh, we have the entire state. We compare it against the hash. Uh, then we append those changes. We hash it again, and we store it. Um, so that's like the, the basic example. You say store. What do you mean? We store the state root. We store the hash on, on the shard. Store the hash. Okay. Yeah. Um, and all of this translated into the, the, the YAML test format. Um, I hope you guys are still with me. Um, but the, the YAML test format has to refer to all those different bits we have tried to explain with the diagrams. Uh, so it lists uh, the beacon state with all these uh, execution uh, wasm blobs. If you have a list of the pre-states, we have any number of blocks. And the blocks, the environment here with the, with the index is referring to uh, both the index in this list, so the state, and the index in this execution script. Uh, since this is the Hello World example, it doesn't change uh, the root. Now, this is the bigger example where we mix uh, two of these execution environments. Um, and you can also notice that uh, the, so the zeros is, is for the, the Hello World example. But the Bazaar example has an actual hash on the, on the pre-state and has a different hash. Uh, so this one in the bottom should be different than this one. Uh, and the three blocks we have here, we're sending uh, to the Hello World. We, we don't send anything. And then again, we don't send anything. And to the Bazaar, we send uh, this entire uh, data blob. Um, so that's. The, the way to interact with, with this prototyping engine is you need to write this YAML file, and you need to provide the, the WASM bytecode for it. And, and that's all. And you can write the, the WASM bytecode in whatever, whatever language format you want to write it in. So the next steps we had to do is uh, we have to add a couple more examples uh, to be useful examples, because this bazaar is not really useful. 
And we want to add a framework uh, where from the same uh, code base, you can generate two outputs. You can generate this execution environment, which is the, uh, the code deployed. So it's basically a verifier. Uh, and you can also generate a relayer, which is basically the one generating the, the input, blo input blocks. Um, and initially, this will be a command line interface uh, where one can just send the, the actual uh, developer-friendly values, and it's going to generate these YAML files. We also want to support multiple engines. We need, uh, in generally, a, a friendly and friendlier interface. Uh, and we also want to add a feature where somebody submitting a new execution environment on GitHub as a PR, they're going to get the benchmarking results right there. Um, so the next step for, for everyone interested in this is to, to join the squad, uh, Scout Squad, where if you write a new execution environment and submit it as a PR, uh, then uh, you're going to see all the benchmarking results for that, uh, which can inform your decisions to, to make it better. Uh, and you can also join our secret, or not so secret, uh, Telegram channel, where we discuss all these uh, execution environments. Um, so that was it on, on Scout. I'm not sure if we have three minutes for questions. So go ahead. Uh, so there are multiple execution environments tied to um, a single shard, or is it a single execution environment per shard? Multiple. Is there any limits to how many can be deployed on a shard, or is it, I mean, there has to be some economic. So, thing, yeah, the right? limit would come from, one way I imagine it is um, the limits come from the same, the limits work the same way that limits on validator accounts work, which validator accounts, it requires uh, a 32 Ether deposit, but then actually uh, you can hold as little as one Ether in a validator account. You just can't be an active validator. So if you imagined, uh, um, yeah, however much, um, however many ether there is, then if every one of those one ether was a uh, an execution environment, like you'd have to deposit one ether to, you know, or burn it if you wanted it to uh, want it to be permanently deployed. It has to be expensive enough that, you know, it's constrained. So on that, so we so far we talked about this 32 byte state thread, uh, but there's an idea that maybe that should be extended to be bigger. Uh, to support maybe RC accumulators or anything else. And, and if we consider that, then this deposit has to scale with the actual data you want to keep on a shard. I mean, yeah. there will be, like, you can't execute. Like, there will be a limit of how much you can execute on time. So there's also, like, there has to be some constraints in the system. Yeah, the, the simple model we have is it's, it's, one transaction per block, so it's only, you know, you only execute one execution environment per block. Right, so if you make the then dumb choice of deploying your 100th execution environment to the, to the shard, you only get to be executed every 100 blocks, whereas if you deploy it somewhere else, you'll be able to run more often. Right, and that's why, you know, there's this, uh, Vitalik's a big fan of yanking, so you, you know, yank it to a different shard or something if you needed to. Is there metering at the execution environment level? Not right now, but uh, yeah, the plan is that there is, but it, it has a fixed uh, limit. When you uh, say not right now, you mean not in the prototype? Or? Not in the prototype, yes. And, and not in the proposals. It's not explicitly stated in the proposals, uh, but there is no idea, at least right now, to, uh, to have any kind of fee market on that, on the execution engines. Uh, that how many, I mean, not fee market, but rather to change the block gas limit. It would be a fixed limit. Right. Okay. That, that may, um, Guess that's lunch then. Thank you.